On March the 10th, 2012, an Italian oil tanker ran aground on a rocky cliff in Sicily, just off the coast of one of the world's most cherished cities, Syracuse. The captain had lost control of the vessel during a massive storm, forcing him to abandon ship as it crashed against the rocks. The accident triggered one of Italy's most dramatic and dangerous helicopter rescues to save the 19 crew on board. A year and a half later, Dutch and Italian salvage masters came to the rescue to cut up the wreck and take it away for scrap in order to restore this beautiful stretch of Mediterranean coastline. A severe storm in March 2012 surprised many a ship in the Mediterranean. But one vessel in particular would be caught in its grip and end up beached on the perilous cliffs of Sicily for over a year. We are talking about a gale force between eight and nine with waves around 10 meters high and winds of around 64 to 68 knots so these were really difficult conditions, a very severe storm. As the ship rammed up against the sharp rocks, rescuing the crew pushed Coast Guard helicopter pilot skills to the limit. When the storm subsided, there was no option but to call in an international team of Dutch and Italian salvers. The whole operation is directed by a salvage master. However, it is a team effort, a question of planning. First, when we, we got that call, um, what I do is I try to get as much information as possible. Otherwise, I just uh, get my gear and I, I come here to the, uh, to the warehouse, pick up my stuff and I uh, go to the, to the airport. So close to the city limits of this prime tourist destination, it was critical that the sad sight of the wreck disappear from view. Over the months, the steel carcass was literally cut up, then hauled away to be broken into the smallest pieces of scrap iron. The structure was, let's say, to coin a phrase, attacked. It was a bit like lions attacking their prey. Syracuse. Two and a half thousand years ago, this fortress city rivaled Athens and Sparta in power and wealth. It is located on the southeastern tip of the Mediterranean's largest island, Sicily, and today is one of UNESCO's World Heritage Sites. Syracuse is a city where even today people come to study our history and our archaeological sites. We have the largest Greek theatre in the world. Among other things, Syracuse also has some protected marine areas, so environmental issues are felt acutely here. But there is another side of this part of Sicily that tourists rarely see. The area just north of Syracuse is the Priolo Gargallo petrochemical complex, one of the largest of its kind in Europe. It is also one of Italy's most polluted sites on the national list of environmental cleanup priorities. The discovery of petroleum in the 1950s triggered an economic boom in Sicily with refineries and petrochemical plants of some of the world's energy giants springing up all along the coast. Pipelines stretch out into the sea for tankers to fill up. Enzo Parisi leads an environmental watchdog group that keeps an eye on ship traffic and campaigns for cleaning up hundreds of tons of toxic waste left behind by the chemical plants and oil companies operating here. 
Sicily refines half the oil needed for all of Italy. We have approximately 50 million tons passing through here. On the morning of March the 10th, 2012, an oil tanker belonging to Rome-based oil transport company Augusta Due was returning from having taken a load of crude oil to Porto Marghera, near Venice. The company transports 7 million tons of oil and gas products annually, chartered to some of the biggest multinational energy groups in the world. It was returning to here in Augusta, just north of Syracuse, where it would then load another shipment. There are important refineries here. There's Lukoil, Isab, Erg, to name but a few. Ajip was here. Eni is here. They refine the petroleum, process it, and then transport it to the north of Italy by way of these oil tankers. But that day, a nasty storm was brewing in the Ionian Sea. High winds and rain lashed the coast and whipped up huge waves. A storm of such magnitude hadn't been seen in eastern Sicily in decades. This ship left Porto Marghera on the 8th of March after delivering a cargo of refined crude oil. On its way back, it sailed into a storm that had already been announced in the weather bulletin and according to the magistrates, the captain hadn't paid enough attention, had underestimated the importance of this forecast of bad weather, which was already awful. Port authorities were struggling to take care of the ships already seeking safety in their ports and warned the tanker to head back out to safer waters. A situation like this, as the fishermen confirm, had never been seen before. The waves were so high and so massive that they crashed over both key sides protecting the bay. It was weather that hadn't been seen here in the last 50 or 60 years. As soon as they arrived near the port of Augusta, the control tower on the mainland advised them not to come into port because it wasn't possible. One, because there were already 30 ships sheltering inside the protected area of the port. Two, because it would have been impossible, because the sea was just far too rough. The captain, however, motored on, convinced he could weather the storm and get into port. Despite that they had been advised both by the Coast Guard of Augusta as well as the pilots at Augusta, the ship's crew pushed on with the navigation in the belief that they could make it. As the captain tried in vain to regain control of his vessel, the storm worsened and the jagged volcanic cliffs drew closer. There was a real storm in progress, the likes of which had never been seen before. As many as 32 times, the captain had tried to restart the engine and get going, but the propellers kept coming up out of the water, then jamming, and in the end, the ship was blown completely off course. With the ship empty of cargo and the rough seas, the rudder became useless and the ship was unable to navigate. The boat drifted and completely smashed against the rocks. The mayday was sent out at the last minute, so we had to come to the rescue with our helicopters, which were the only ones at this point that could attempt a sea rescue of the crew on board the ship. Two helicopters were scrambled from the Catania Air Base, an AB-412 and a brand new AW-139. Pilots arriving could see the crew, all wearing life jackets, gathered on the ship's stern for rescue, as waves and 110 kilometer per hour winds swept the vessel. Helicopter pilots first tried to lower a rescue man down onto the ship, but weather conditions made it too dangerous, and the plan was scrapped. 
Each mariner would have to hook himself into a harness to be pulled to safety, as the ship rocked from side to side. Pilots kept losing visual contact. The rescue was proving extremely dangerous. All 19 were saved by the Coast Guard helicopters that, in hovering, that is, by staying right above the ship, were able to lower a harness using a winch and then one by one lift all 19 men into the helicopters. The last one up, of course, was the captain. On land, tension was rising. Two hours later, all 19 members of the crew had been brought to safety. It was one of the Mediterranean's most spectacular and dangerous sea-to-air rescues of modern times. The shaken sailors were transported into Syracuse for medical treatment. They were, of course, cold and afraid. They were hungry, exhausted. The situation was really dramatic. But the oil tanker was now firmly stuck and would stay that way for over a year as officials waded through the massive bureaucracy. This was an environmentally sensitive site and also a protected marine reserve near a UNESCO World Heritage City. It would take months of negotiations before the wreck could be safely salvaged. In March 2012, an oil tanker returning to Sicily after delivering crude oil to a port near Venice crashed into the coast while navigating through a massive storm. 19 crew members were brought to safety in one of the Coast Guard's most impressive sea-to-air rescues ever. But while all the sailors were saved, the tanker itself could not be repaired. It lay disabled just meters from the outskirts of the Sicilian city of Syracuse. The gash was enormous because the bow and the central part of the ship were completely destroyed and this meant that right from the start it was clear that it would have to be cut then scrapped. On the other side of Europe, the salvage company Smith Salvage received a call to assess what could be done. Managers gathered in their Rotterdam shipyard headquarters to discuss an immediate response. Within a day, it was smashed to pieces. Not to pieces, but anyhow, the complete bottom ripped out. First indication, no refloating possible. So other things need to be performed. Just two months before, Keyes and his Smith salvage masters had been on another high-profile shipwreck along a beautiful Italian coastline, the Costa Concordia, which capsized off the port of Giglio in Tuscany. 32 lives were lost in that disaster, and the ship was left beached near the port for more than two years, as the world's top salvage masters struggled to right it, refloat it, and tow it away. When the tanker ran aground near Syracuse, immediately there were comparisons and concerns that the shipwreck might draw similar negative attention. Of course it attracted attention because just two months before there had been the much more important, more serious incident of the Costa Crociere. So people thought that this was the repetition in miniature of the tragedy that had struck the island of Giglio. The, uh, that's why the, the authorities took so long with the negotiations to, to have it removed, because they wanted to be sure that anything that everything happened according to the book, because they were very afraid of the media, of the uh, attention this uh, might get. The tanker that ran aground off Syracuse had been built recently, in 2007, in the Tuzla shipyards in Turkey. That made it appealing to looters, so city officials sealed off the area to prevent anyone from climbing on board. 
The ship was brand new, so it was very appealing. We decided to cordon off the area in such a way that also from the land nobody could get close to it. We arranged a continuous patrol by a private security firm who was there 24 hours a day, and we put up floodlights to illuminate the area during the night to avoid any kind of problem. The stranded ship quickly became a spectacle for local residents who rode out on the bike trail to marvel at the troubled vessel. With a 14-meter gash in its side, listing 40 degrees and groaning against the rocks. Everything was in full view of everyone, of the people who lived in the area, who were always looking out at it, but also those who walked, cycled, jogged around there. So every day we were dealing with the public, mainly with those who lived there, but not just them, because the only bicycle path we have just happens to be right there. Once the site was protected, officials began monitoring the immediate environmental danger. Though the tanker had been empty when it was wrecked, the reserve tanks held nearly 25,000 cubic meters of oil, gas, and fuel. Large floating barriers were laid to prevent any fuel spills. Technicians reviewed the ship and determined it was damaged in holds one, two, and six. All of the holds and the machine room were flooded. It was clear that the ship could not be refloated. Bids went out for who would carry out the salvage. The contract was eventually won by the team from Smith Salvage, one of the world's biggest salvage companies. Smith has taken on some of the most complex salvages worldwide. They save burning ships, retrieve dangerous cargoes, and raise some of the biggest vessels on the seas today. Jules Martina has been around the world on salvages, but it was his first trip to Sicily. What he found on site led him to believe the only option available was to cut the tanker into pieces and demolish it. All the tanks were, uh, were ruptured and, and uh, the bottom side of the vessel was severely damaged. So there was no way we could have uh, refloated it. And that's the reason why we decided that the best uh, solution is to, to cut the vessel in, in, in pieces and, and remove it away. So it, it's, it was severely damaged. We were dealing with a chemical transport ship that had become lodged on the rocks of Syracuse. The plan was to cut the ship into seven pieces plus the superstructure. Everywhere they go around the world, Smith always partner with local companies. In Italy, while working on the Costa Concordia, they formed a close bond with a family of historical salvage masters from Tuscany, Neri Salvage. It seemed only natural for them to work on this salvage in Sicily together as well. They provided the, the vessels that we used and the, the sea legs, the, the tugboats and, and the sea legs, and we provided the rest of the equipment like divers and uh, diving equipment, the chains, the slings, uh, the, the bullets, all the sort of uh, equipment that we, we did, and, and they did uh, the vessels. These tugs in particular, but also other crafts in our fleet, are classified for salvage, which means that on board they have specific equipment like depletion pumps, water extraction pumps and so on, to provide emergency assistance to ships in need or in difficulty. The close-knit family of Tuscan salvage masters Neri Salvage have been perfecting the art of shipbuilding and recovery since the 1800s, here in the port of Livorno. Corrado Neri is the fifth generation of his family to work in the salvage sector. His ancestors were known as among the best shipbuilders and salvers in Italy. Piero Neri is the one tasked with now handing his job down to the next generation. 
My great-grandfather, Costante, was the one who made the big step forward. He started to build the first big wooden boats, and so these wooden boats drew close to the ships, and they were able to take the cargo and offload in the canals of the port of Livorno. My great-grandfather's stroke of genius was to concentrate on one particular sector of marine services, in fact, the riskiest but also the one with the highest profit potential. The Neri family was able to raise ships that other experts had written off as lost forever. In 1924, he carried out a major salvage operation on a Dutch ship, Reaperkirk, which had sunk outside the port of Bastia and in contrast with the opinion of the Lloyds experts of the time, who believed the ship could not be salvaged, we managed to salvage both the ship and its cargo. By 1924, Piero's grandfather, Tito, had built such a reputation that the family was sought out by Hollywood giant Metro Goldwyn Mayer to help stage epic sea battle scenes for the first silent film of Ben-Hur. Neri Salvage struck a deal with MGM to build all the ships, find all the extras, and coordinate the scenes. It was a deal that would go down in family history. Metro Golden Mayor came to Livorno, contacted my grandfather, and wanted to reach an agreement with him. They asked Tito, what kind of contract do you want? And my grandpa said, exactly the same kind of contract you usually sign in the United States. My grandfather had never studied. He knew just a couple of words of English. But he managed to get himself a contract in which all his expenses were reimbursed, plus 20% of the film's box office takings. And he started to earn a fortune. But World War II would nearly destroy the family of courageous Italian salvage masters. Knowing the port of Livorno would be bombed, which it was by both German and Allied forces, Tito Neri made an unthinkable calculation. He would sink his fleet to save it. My grandfather had suffered the requisitioning of a few of his ships and tugs. He decided to sink all the ones he had left, so he could bring them to the surface again once the storm had passed. So that's exactly what he did. He sunk them all in the port of Livorno, and afterwards he brought them up again, and he had his fleet once more. With most of the fleet salvaged, after the war the intrepid family was in business once again. With its historic reputation and contacts throughout Italy, Neri immediately found local partners to help the salvage and demolition in Sicily. They formed a consortium to work hand in hand with Smith salvage masters. But in the months ahead, this international team of experts would face some serious challenges. A large oil tanker had run aground on the island of Sicily in March 2012. 19 members of the crew had barely escaped with their lives, but the tanker remained stranded on the perilous coast near Syracuse. Quickly, contracts were secured to protect the ship, clean up the fuel, and salvage the damaged tanker. The unpredictable spring weather made the fuels sitting in the stranded oil tanker a danger to the local environment. Floating barriers were installed around the ship to contain any possible spills. Coast Guard divers verified all the conditions underwater. Oil skimming machines and other equipment were put on standby in case the pump failed or the hose ruptured during the fuel transfer, causing an oil spill. Neri's tugs are specially equipped to handle any disaster at sea. 
funzione principale del rimorchiatore è quella di traino. The tug's principal functions are pulling and to prevent fire and pollution. They supply depletion pumps, which are pumps that are attached to the stranded ship and pump out the water, allowing the ship to float once more. Our fleet has more than 30 vessels, which range from 3,000 horsepower up to 10,000. The plan for removing the wrecked oil tanker from the Syracuse coastline seemed fairly simple on paper. After being cut into sections, it would be lifted away and recycled. The salvage would use a technique called chain cutting, a process that uses a cable, sometimes coated with diamonds or other abrasive material, to slice the vessel into pieces. It, it works like a, like a saw. You pull uh, the chain through from one side, from, from, from for example, from uh, port side to, uh, to starboard, and you hang it into the, uh, the blocks of the, uh, the sheer legs, and then you start moving the, the blocks up and down, and, <laughs> and you run the chain through the, through the, through the, uh, through the metal of the, of the ship, and, and it cuts it uh, right through. The part of the ship that was outside the water would be cut with large chains, attached to this crane barge, or shear leg, the biggest of its kind in the Mediterranean, and able to pull 1,000 tons. It would use its massive leverage to move the chain back and forth through the double-hulled ship. Underwater, divers would make hot cuts. The equipment that we needed was uh, a crane barge and uh, a uh, shear legs to, uh, to pull chains on, on the, underneath the, uh, the vessel and also we needed um, divers to do some, some cutting on the water because um, normally what we, we do with the, when we are going to lift a wreck we try to pull uh, slings and chains under the, under the wreck but because this wreck was sitting hard on the, on the rocks uh, it was impossible to get the chains underneath so we had to do some, some cutting with divers. There is a preliminary job on the part of the divers. They have to identify the way in which the lifting cables should be applied before the sections can be raised. Those red blocks or jiggers that you see behind me can each lift 500 tons. From there, the steel cables are run, which will raise the sections of the ship. But local environmental agencies and activists had been following the plans for the salvage with concern. Syracuse, the Bay of Santa Panagia, but also the marine reserves of Capomuro di Porco are a treasure trove of biodiversity. To put all this biodiversity at risk wouldn't just be harming Syracuse and its historic natural and cultural heritage, but it would also damage the biodiversity of the entire Mediterranean. An investigation was launched into the original cause of the wreck. The black box was opened to get to the bottom of the incident. According to the investigation carried out by the Syracuse magistrates and with the evidence taken from the black box, they were able to reconstruct events and attribute responsibility exclusively to the captain. However, the accident could have been much worse. Just a few hundred meters away were several docks for loading and unloading oil products, which the tanker only narrowly missed. A collision would have spelled disaster. An oil leak in the area where the Magna Grecia was born. The cliffs, the city, the beaches, the nature trails, the marine reserves. We would not only have caused an environmental disaster, but would also have wiped out, or at least put at risk, a cultural and historical heritage which is one of the most important in the world. Local environmental groups were already nervous, and now it was clear that the salvage would generate both noise and debris. The wreck was lying just meters away from the densely populated quarter of Mazzarona. 
Residents there were starting to have concerns about the plan to cut the ship into pieces, that fragments might be deposited on the seabed. Authorities cordoned off an 800-meter area surrounding the ship where locals were accustomed to fishing for tuna and relaxing along the panoramic coastline. Others worried the chain cutting might be noisy. We also have to address the noise because we are near the coast where people visit, near apartments, so we have to protect the environment, not just from water pollution or air pollution through dust particles, but even noise pollution. The environmental part and all the preliminary studies, as much as it is possible to do, is an urgent concern for the authorities. So salvage companies have to dedicate a lot of attention to environmental monitoring of the marine seabed to return the site to its pristine environmental condition. Once the necessary environmental precautions had been taken, it took Augustea and Smith workers a month and a half to pump out the fuel from the ship's engines. We have uh, several uh, equipment that we use, like we have the hot tap that, uh, that we use for, uh, for removing oil that's out of the tanks. We have uh, some sort of a heating system that we use to, uh, to heat the oil, oil up if it's uh, very, very cold and uh, the density is very thick that you cannot uh, get it out. So we've got different uh, systems that, that we use to, uh, to remove the oil out. After the oil had been removed, preparations could begin for the cutting stage. You have to make sure that uh, even though the vessel was empty, that all the, uh, the lines and the tanks are, are, are empty. And you have to make sure that you have walkways and platforms and stuff because the vessel was at a 30 degree angle. And we had to make uh, the working area safe for the people to, to work there. So all these preparations take some time. It's not just to go there and do the cut and that's it. More than a year later, under the heat of the Sicilian sun in June of 2013, preparations were complete and it was time to salvage the tanker. Materials arrived to begin the delicate task. It would also have to be stripped of its recyclable parts. Every object, including the crew's quarters, would be taken out and reused if possible. 90% of the ship is metal, so everything that was recycled was analyzed. All the pieces that arrived here were analyzed in accordance with the environmental regulations of the state and regional agencies. The salvage plan called for each section to be chain cut, then lifted carefully out of the sea onto a waiting barge then transferred to a large floating dock in the Baia di Santa Panagia. Before it could be scrapped, however, engineers had to study the way the vessel was built to determine where best to make the cuts. Once we had individualized where to do the cuts, we proceeded to do the actual cutting, initially with the chain and the exposed parts. Remember that the ship was leaning to the left, and mainly out of the water, and so the exposed parts were cut using heat cutters and the submerged part using chains. But performing a salvage so near the jagged cliffs would be a major challenge. The ship was located very close to the cliffs, so we came about 20 meters from the ship, but the problem was the undertow around the vessel and against a cliff, which moved the pontoon in sudden and unexpected directions. Once the initial hurdles had been overcome and work actually began, the salvage ploughed forward at a swift pace. On the 20th of June, we did the first piece, and then on a weekly basis, 
all the other pieces from the bow to the stern. Each week we would reduce one piece, weighing about 700 tons, in order to leave space for the next piece. The barges and cranes that would house the cable for the chain cutters and then lift the massive pieces of metal out of the sea were hauled into position by the high-tech Nary tugs. These small tugs are dwarfed by the ships they must salvage, but their size is no measure of their strength. The tugs are small with respect to the objects they are called to come and pull, but that is their function, because in these small dimensions, there is a huge amount of power in the engine designed for pulling. It's a bit like a tractor on land. It's not the speed that counts, but the pulling power. The tugs work throughout the Mediterranean on salvages and on offshore platforms as far away as Africa. They often pull the floating cranes, Meloria and Italia. Their operators are able to maneuver in the most difficult situations, using the tug's pulling force to turn on its own axis. A tow cable, the main cable, which is often made of steel, is passed to the ship and then thanks to the pulling power of the tug and the swiveling propellers that can turn 360 degrees, the tug starts towing and is extremely maneuverable because it has these swiveling propellers that allow it to move in every direction. But as the salvage progressed, engineers would grapple with some major problems caused by the way the ship lay. The chemical tanker had rammed up against volcanic cliffs just around the corner from the beautiful Mediterranean port of Syracuse in March 2012. The disabled vessel would need to be cut up, hauled away to another site in the Santa Panagia Bay and demolished. It needed to be removed, not just for the risk it represented being there, but also because there was the need for the authorities to give a strong and concrete signal that there was the will to address this type of problem. But before the wreck could be removed, engineers would have to deal with some crucial structural issues. The center of the ship, section C, had been crushed and so part of it was stuck on the sea floor. And so we had to rechain up this part, stuck to the bottom of the sea, and pull it up in two sections. The last piece, rather the second to last, because the stern segment with the engine had already been removed, so the part before the stern, part B, which contained part of the superstructure, the lower part of the superstructure, and the part of the engine, that was the more complex part, because it was the part that had been most damaged. So it couldn't be stabilized on land. We had to prop it up, and we lost a few weeks to prop it up, and lower it, and then reduce it on land. Salvage masters wanted to prevent the ship's engine fluids from leaking into the Mediterranean Sea. So cutting that section took particular care, as did the section of the ship that had caved in after smashing into the rocks. Sections A and B were the most delicate as far as protecting the environment was concerned because that is where the motor was. These sections still held pollutants and it was impossible for the divers to clean out the fuel tank and it still contained pollutants. But we were able to contain it and resolve it with the floating absorbent barriers. Port authorities and the Coast Guard had been keeping a close eye on the progress of the salvage. Today, like every single day since March 10, 2012, we filed a daily report indicating step by step what the situation was, what was being monitored, what the salvage activity was, 
what authorizations were needed, what the weather and sea conditions were on site, how many men, how many machines, and all this activity was done on a daily basis. We cut it, and it took us four months. The shear legs lifted all the sections of the ship and transferred them to a barge, which had been pulled by tugboats to a pontoon where the demolition yard was. At the end of the four months, media, state and local officials from the Coast Guard were invited to watch the final phase of the salvage be completed. After the last sections were lifted and taken away, the coastline could finally return to its beautiful wild state. Together with our partners, we cleaned uh, most of the, 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 the beach area that, uh, with the, the stuff that was still on, on the beach. And for the, for the parts that were on the water, we removed as much as possible. With the pieces successfully raised, just a few miles down the coast, a local company was preparing for one of its biggest ship demolitions ever. Shipbreaking is a type of ship disposal that involves breaking up the vessels for scrap recycling. The Sicilian company Caschetto had demolished dozens of wooden boats that had carried migrants over the Straits of Sicily. This job was massive in comparison. But with three cranes, cutters and grippers all at work, the company set out to begin tearing the tanker apart, bit by bit. Our company, Fratelli Caschetto, has a history in naval demolition, but this was a big project. We had about 20 people working in full regime. We had a lot of heavy demolition machines working. Finally, the tanker had been successfully removed from the scenic coastline of Syracuse. All in all, this was a national victory. In our opinion, it was a feather in the cap for Italian operational and administrative organization. I would say that there's been positive feedback from everyone. And although some said that there were risks involved, we managed to contain those risks, see them coming, and avoid them so as to ensure that the operation was completed without any problems. Once again, an environmental disaster in the heart of Sicily's oil refining district had been avoided. But there are those who believe it is only a matter of time before there is another such incident, and that not enough has been done to prepare for that day. We can't wait for another accident to happen, only to remember and say, we told you so, but nothing was done. We must do something now, because some of these things cost nothing. It's just a question of common sense. All it takes is to identify the preventive measures that need to be taken. Otherwise, we will have to tell this story once again. For the time being, however, Sicilians can look out over the cliffs near Syracuse without seeing a wreck that for more than a year was a blight on one of the Mediterranean's most beautiful landscapes.